massive thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon for this webinar on voices from the gallery all around curation a really exciting subject um, my name is amanda smithers as you can see i'm a core fellow and core associate facilitator and i'm your host for the webinar this afternoon and it's lovely to have you all with us and huge thank you to claw leadership and to the art fund for working together to make this afternoon possible as well um, it's great to have you here and it's lovely and really important to have these spaces and these conversations at the moment too. Um, this afternoon we have three brilliant speakers with us. Um, there's a slight change to the running order. Um, one person um, unfortunately had to drop out due to family reasons, but we have three brilliant people with us. So just to let you know in advance who, who you'll be hearing from, it's Esther Fox, Head of Accentuate, Annabelle Campbell, who's a curator, Creative Partnerships and Programmes at Crafts Council, and Marenka Thompson Odlum, who's the research associate at the Pitt Rivers Museum. And all three of them are offering a different lens, a different perspective on the craft of curation this afternoon, um, with very different stories to, to share with you. Um, and the plan for this afternoon is that we'll have time to hear from each of our speakers first. Um, they've all been asked to offer a kind of presentation provocation around eight minutes long. And then we're going to dive into some conversation between us. And then there will be a chance for questions from you, a Q&A session in effect. So as the afternoon goes on, there's an invitation to you to post questions in the chat. If you think of things that you'd like us to, to think about and address, please do use the chat for that. And if you could make life simpler for us by putting questions at the beginning, that would be great. It would really help. And your name, obviously, as well. Um, obviously, we're on Zoom and we've all been on Zoom forever. We know the protocols. But just a reminder, if you can stay on mute when you're not speaking, that'd be grand. Um, really, really helpful. And if you'd like to access captions, we've got stream text captions running um, and we'll post that link in the chat for those of you that may not have seen it as well. And just a, a thing about the space as well and the kind of, I guess, the feel for this afternoon. We want this afternoon to be really honest, a space where people can be really um, open about the work that they do and the practice that they have around curation um, and also just really respectful of those views and those different ways of working. We're encouraging listening and encouraging kind of debate and discussion and also encouraging you to take away from hearing lessons, learning and to reflect, find some space to reflect on what's really resonating for, for you from the conversations today too. We'd love that to happen. So as I say, We've got three brilliant speakers with us this afternoon, um, all offering a different perspective, a different lens on their practice as curators. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna dive into those presentations. Um, and I'm gonna invite Esther Fox um, to step forward, who's sharing with us some thinking around curating around her practice, um, around disabled people and how they are represented. So welcome Esther, who is head of Accentuate. Thanks very much, Amanda. I'm so delighted to um, be invited to speak today. Um, so maybe if I just give you a tiny little bit of background about um, Accentuate and how we've come to this point really. And then I've got a few slides that I'd just like to share with you after that. So um, Accentuate is a programme that works with disabled people across the cultural sector. We've been running for about 12 years now. And one of the kind of major projects that we did that we ran over four years was called History of Place. And we looked at eight different built heritage sites across the country and worked with over a hundred volunteers to uncover hidden histories that related to deaf and disabled people's history. But during that process, um, the kind of final outcome was three exhibitions that we did in partnership with the Museum of Liverpool, Emma Shed in Bristol and the V&A in London. And through the process of kind of putting those exhibitions together, we sort of soon realised that actually it was quite difficult to find deaf and disabled curators. In fact, we weren't coming in contact with any at that point. And that threw up some dilemmas around how you tell authentic stories about disabled people's history if the curators don't have that kind of knowledge and experience themselves. So that was really how we came up with this new project called 
curating for change, which is what I'm going to talk briefly about today. So just going to share my screen, if I may. Um, quickly. Great. So we have recently received um, funding from Art Fund and um, Heritage Fund to kind of deliver the, the first phase of the programme. So we've been doing a lot of um, consultation at this stage. And what we aim for the programme to do, and we, if we get further funding to be able to deliver the programme, is to bring about a sea change in the way deaf and disabled and neurodivergent people are represented in our museums. So this will happen through a tailored work placement programme of both fellowships and traineeships and through public exhibitions and events. And we're also establishing a new network of over 20 museums to share learning, de demonstrate exemplar ways of working across the sector. So those host museums will host the fellowships and the traineeships. So just to let you know who's involved, um, the National Railway Museum in York, Thackeray Museum of Medicine, Museum of Liverpool, Black Country Living Museum, Pitt Rivers and Ashmolean are doing a joint placement, Bristol Culture, Hastings Museum and Art Gallery, and the historic dockyard in Chapman, in Chatham, sorry. And those are for fellowships. So there'll be work placements for a deaf or disabled curator over 18 months to really kind of get their teeth stuck into some research, find out really about the whole process of being a curator, working in a co-production way with disabled people themselves, and then delivering a final kind of event or exhibition or digital output or a mix of all three. And then we've also got um, museum hosts for trainees. So they're the Cumbria Museum Consortium, Kettles Yard and Sedgwick Museum, again, a joint placement, North Hertfordshire Museum, Nottinghamshire Museums, the Imperial War Museum, the Horniman Museum, Colchester and Ipswich Museums, and the Museum of English Rural Life. So as you can see, that's quite a broad range of museums that we're working with as well. But I sort of tried to explain earlier why for us the role of curator was so important. And I suppose we sort of think there are three things here. They're, you know, the, they're the keeper of the collections and of the knowledge. So, so they're able to really to influence what kind of collections are being made and also being able to kind of really give that in-depth knowledge about those those items. They're also a specialist in practice and a communicator of stories to engage with audiences. So there's an image here on the right hand side, which is um, a sort of drawing uh, taken from some of the consultation work that we've been doing during this last period. And this was kind of some of the thinking that came out of it around what is a curator, somebody that collects, cares for, communicates and hopefully collaborates. And the need of flexibility if you're really genuine about opening up not only kind of roots in for people to become curators but also for people to really engage with museums and exhibits so what if curators don't have lived experience of knowledge or alternative histories so we wanted to kind of do some consultation to really hear from disabled people themselves about they, what they wanted to see in museums. So I just wanted to give you a couple of quotes. Show me myself and the times that we did survive and sometimes even thrive throughout history, not only as activists. And while you're at it, let's reclaim some of the disabled figures in history for ourselves. Lord Byron was physically disabled. Leonardo da Vinci likely had ADHD. Dorothy Miles, a deaf woman, we believe, had bipolar. Show me where we thrived, not as inspiration, but as evidence that we have always been here and that we have made a vital contribution to the world that non-disabled people live in today. So that was one respondent. Um, and this is saying that museums can often feel like an extension of state from their signage to their covert behavioral codes Frequently, they hold up whatever the subject of culture of a tiny minority, e.g. just kings, landed gentry, etc. As the culture of our country, as representing the whole of our country, when clearly this is factually incorrect. They have a fetishism of objects above ways of commemorating 
experience or community, which is often, which is not forward thinking. The last two, they often relegate to some side educational room or some paper cut out children's activity. So I wanted to share those two quotes because I thought it was really important to hear that when we're talking about any alternative histories, it's about hearing about real people's lives that seems to be the thing that's really resonating with, with people and understanding about experience and community, maybe above just the kind of prioritising of, of objects. So I think where we are now is probably at a really pivotal point. And I just wanted again, just to say a quick uh, quote from the UKRI. In the context of climate emergency, Black Lives Matter and a global pandemic, the shifting habits of museum audiences provide a catalyst for change in the sector not seen since World War II. So we are at a pivotal point where we can make change. So just three kind of points I'd like you to consider. What is genuine co-production and how can we give a voice to authentic narratives if currently as curators you don't have the knowledge or lived experience? How can we think about new ways of presenting these narratives that are accessible and meaningful to all, particularly now that COVID-19 has changed the way museum audiences engage with museums? And what I mean around that is there's been certainly in our consultation a huge emphasis on the positive impact that the digital engagement has had for disabled people who have often been excluded from museum programming because they can't physically get somewhere so having alternative ways of engaging people particularly using digital has really been something that disabled people have found very positive during the pandemic and how can we open up the workforce to disabled people so that we can really embed longer term sustained change. Now, I think it's probably about my eight minutes, so I can't say much more, but I can't really go into workforce change at this point, but I would just like to say we are producing a report at the end of July that looks at actually all of the consultation we've done during this period, and that does cover workforce development as well. So thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, and um, Esther, that was really, really interesting, really refreshing as well to hear kind of a, a positive, proactive kind of project in a way that's going to start to create that shift too and make change for people. I love what you say about real people's lives and the importance of that, the authenticity of that in, in how we work and who are, is in our teams and how we programme. So thank you so much for that. Lots of thought provoking bits. So moving on um, and now we're moving through to Annabelle who is here um, to talk about her, her very recent experience as in today <laughs> um, at the Crafts Council of creating um, an exhibition in essence for a new space so Annabelle you can talk about it because it's hot off the press so to speak Yes, totally. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a bit about um, um, a, a specific project, and that is one that we're actually just installing right now. So to give you a bit of a kind of potted history. So um, the Crafts Council had a gallery that closed uh, in 2005, and we've been working towards reopening the space, which was due to open last year, last March. And the, at the beginning of the plans for the space, it was decided that, you know, it was an opportunity to show the collection, which had never been presented as a collection display. And um, so I was charged with kind of thinking about how to curate the collection for the first time. And uh, in thinking about that, it's a snapshot collection, not a survey. So kind of um, standard kind of chron chronolo chrono chronological approach or a kind of material led approach wouldn't really work. So I was looking through the organisation's archives and there was a really important exhibition that marked 10 years of the organisation called The Maker's Eye, in which a group of makers were invited to, to, to do a visual presentation of what craft meant to them through a selection of objects. So this seemed like a really good approach. So the collection, it's a public collection, and it was developed to be for makers and for audiences and in a way not for the organisation itself. So I decided that I was going to invite a group of makers who had work 
within, whose work was represented in the collection to respond to a brief to to consider actually what what does craft mean what does craft look like to them through work in the collection and that the idea was that this would really show the breadth of what craft can be what it can look like what it can mean to people so was the project this so we started with this so each each uh, of the makers was um uh, given full full access to all the collections including the archive and were asked to collect to select up to 15 objects and also to consider one work that they feel should be in the collection that wasn't in the collection as the project evolved this moved from being a, a, a collection display which would be kind of a two-year semi-permanent to being a temporary exhibition so decided that we were going to stick with it as a temporary exhibition and just try and have this really object rich um, celebration of the collection but through these very different voices and lenses. So we were installed in the exhibition last March and a week we were due to open the week after lock, the first lockdown came in so we spent that final week deinstalling an exhibition that was never seen and well, I mean, obviously that was hugely frustrating, but also it gave us a year to kind of really consider not only the exhibition and its content, but also the collection. We knew that there was lots of work that we wanted to look at, kind of like what 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 does a collection look like? How would it, how would we develop it? Um, how would we use it? Whose collection is it? Who makes those decisions about what what goes into a collection? And um, something that I was saying to kind of Kate earlier today is that what the, the one of the real values I think of exhibitions is that uh, they are they are projects so, and they are an opportunity to to explore to test ideas to be quite provocative as well and that they they are never the, the real change makers they can they they can support and um feed into a wider um kind of organisational change. So the, the collection, like, like most collections, are also uh, a kind of snapshot of an organisation. They are products of a time. And the Cross Council Collection, like, like all other collections, are a particular view of a subject through a particular lens at a time. So we decided that Maker's Eye, was a, the exhibition, was a really great opportunity to bring, to test some ideas as well. And so we invited a, um, a curator to respond to exactly the same brief that had been given to our 13 makers and to, to consider what does craft mean and look like to her through work that is not in the collection and to select one work that is in the collection. And so uh, we invite, worked with Christine Chichenska, who is the uh, curator at the V&A uh, for Black British fashion, for Black fashion. And uh, so she selected a group of contemporary artworks, not in the collection. And uh, through, so we, talk, we were talking to Christine about how this would be embedded in the exhibition, how uh, the, her selection would be, um, uh, her selection would be presented and it was really clear that it had to be treated no differently. So she is in a list of the, or the full list of curator selectors, there are 14 now, and the works, but her works are, um, they, they kind of are, are spread throughout the whole display. They're kind of provocateurs throughout the whole exhibition. And so what this has also helped us really do is, uh, is to show actually what contemporary craft can look like today through a whole range of different views, perspectives and narratives. And we're thinking, and so using all these conversations and all these, the work that we've done around the exhibition um, since you know, its inception, to think about actually how that feeds into um, the organisation for programming, what, whose craft is it that we are showing, whose artwork, whose are the, those narrative voices, how reviewing the acquisition policy as well as to how we build and acquire and who are those decision makers as well and I think that's my time up. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you Annabelle. Really interesting to hear how the decision about how one exhibition is curated actually affects and impacts on the whole organisation around the culture, around policies, around representation of that organisation as well. So thank you. The, the, the impact and the power and the kind of potential role of the curator in that is enormous. Thank you. And finally, last but by no means least, 
we are going to now hear from Marenka. So Marenka Thompson Odenham is um, a research associate at Pitt Rivers Museum. And she is with us today to really think about and to, and to share the, the Labelling Matters project, which is a fascinating piece of work. Um, Marenka, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so yes, I work at the Pitt Rivers Museum um, as a research on labeling matters, which is like looks at the problematic um, nature of a lot of the language that's used within the museum. And um, if you're not familiar with the Pitt Rivers, it's one of the uh, University of Oxford museums and houses an anthropological and archaeological collections, approximately 500,000 objects, photos, manuscripts, um, and sound archives from almost every country around the world. Um, and the Pit Rivers is very much situated in the colonial context. It was founded in 1884, yes, and acquired most of its objects during the height of British colonialism and through colonial networks. So as shown by this map, if I can get it. Um, here you can see kind of the largest areas of collecting, which are the bigger spot dots, kind of overlap with the areas that were for the former, former British um, Empire. And so the, this overlap, um, coupled with the anthropological and ethnographic nature of the museum, um, and a lot of the objects and the communities associated with them were interpreted and labeled in ways that are still steeped in coloniality. Um, so basically meaning that these objects and the cultural groups are often spoken about in relation to white Eurocentrism and often along the line of false hierarchical narratives to kind of justify colonialism. And what do I mean exactly by this? Um, as you can see here, some of the uh, historical and current language used in the museum space um, continually reinforces these notions of hierarchy. Um, so for example, you have, these are some old labels um, and here you can see on the left, um, there is a word term that I'm going to use just as the K word because that's offensive. Um, and it is used uh, mainly to talk about black South African people. Um, and it was really weaponized during the period of apartheid. And so this um, term, I, I actually can be still found in the museum because it wasn't only just on labels, which are easier to remove, but they were physically written on the objects by field collectors. Um, so people who were like anthropologists and archeologists that were going around collecting. And so it's written um, on them. And then you also have kind of um, the same with the top one that uses the term black fellows to um, talk about, to refer to Aboriginal Australian peoples, which of course immediately racializes them and places them in contrast to the white settler communities. Um, but then you also have those labels that are, you have to make you think a little bit deeper. They're more euphemistic. Um, and so, you know, but they, and they're harder to spot because they uphold the stereotypes and colonial ideologies, but these are ideologies that we very much steeped in in our everyday life. So the bottom two labels, you can see, um, they refer to, um, they were written around the same time period by the same person, as you can tell by the handwriting. Um, Pretty sure it's Beatrice Blackwood. Anyway, I digress. Um, but they both describe two um, Asian textiles um, that were collected in a military context. However, the wording used is quite different um, when describing a military clash between a British army and non-Western state versus a clash between two Asian factions. So label describing the robe, which was acquired, and I say acquired, um, during the first Anglo-Burmese war in 1824. Um, says that the robe was found in the King of Ava's tent after the Battle of Rangoon. However, the Buddhist monk's robe is listed as being looted um, from the temple um, by a Chinese faction that invaded Mongolia. Uh, this comes up frequently in, in object documentation uh, in which um, if the act is uh, sorry, perpetrated by European powers, the terms looting, plunder, theft, etc., are not used. Uh, this is really evident in the Benin, the case, the current case label for the Benin bronzes uh, in the museum, uh, that you can see the term punitive expedition is actually not, which is a very euphemistic 
term in itself um, is not actually used at all. And the military campaign is like completely downplayed and obscured within the language. And the removal of the bronzes themselves are not problematized in the least. And um, the label almost like kind of squarely like places the blame on the kingdom of Benin. So as I said, sometimes these issues, these issues are kind of really, and these problematic issues are really kind of hard to see because you try and basically see past everything you've been taught. Um, so I've been trying to think of like a framework to help me spot the coloniality and power dynamics at play um, within the displays, interpretation, care, cataloging, and, and et cetera, of the objects and the cultural groups that we work with. So um, based on Annabel Criano's colonial matrix of power, which basically states that coloniality is upheld and perpetuated in kind of three um, major structures. So hierarchy, knowledge, and culture. I always ask myself these like three questions during all my work. So I say, does this piece of work or this label or display um, kind of establish hierarchies? And by that, I mean false hierarchies, usually kind of um, along racial hierarchies, gender and labor, all those things often intersect. Um, does this kind of piece of work assign power to and privilege the production of Eurocentric knowledge? And does it impose white Eurocentric cultural norms? Um, and so I kind of go through each of those questions of every single thing I do. And I'm going to go for a quick example here. Um, is, so for example, here's a label from an opium case in the museum. And it looks at all the ways that um, it reproduces kind of Eurocentric and privileged Eurocentric knowledge. The first thing is it states that opium is a legal narcotic. That's a very value-laden statement, but also it is suggests that legality is universal. Two, it emphasizes the scientific name for a poppy, again, a bid for universality, when the very system of classification is part of a Euro European colonial process. Third, it only mentions China, reinforcing stereotypes and ignoring the global history of opium, kind of especially not mentioning the opium wars that led to legally sanctioned drug trade that helped fuel British colonial economy, but also devastated the populations in India, China, Australia, and other countries. Um, and ooh, I'm running out of time. <laughs> and I'm going to say, yes, there is a fish being skinned in this video. So sorry. <laughs> um, one of the questions I battle with a lot, um, kind of to thinking, how then do we push past these issues that I just mentioned in the label? Um, is that the limit is the limitations to our approach of interpretation emphasis on labeling, especially in ethnographic museums where our interpretive practices cannot express or even sometimes conceive the meaning, use, and importance of some of the objects as they were not created within the same epistemological or ontological systems. So I decided we would need to start reimagining the label in a close collaboration with source communities and stakeholders. Um, and through cultural practices that more closely resonate with the knowledge systems of the objects housed within the pit rivers. So I applied for and what was awarded the Art for New Collecting Award to commission new objects that act both as labels themselves, as labels to parts of the existing collection, as well as emphasize um, indigenous knowledge and practice as being part of a living culture and also ever changing. And so I'm going to go like really quickly through this one. I'm going to play kind of is the short clip, so it's really choppy. But this is Ico. So there's um, a short art film called Autumn Salmon, uh, which I'm acquiring for the museum, which illustrates the making of um, salmon skin boots. And the Ainu, I mean, you should say Ainu salmon skin boots, and the Ainu are indigenous people of Japan, located mainly in the northern region. And this does this thing, it does really great things, but two of the big things is one, it kind of removes the privilege from textual interpretation and knowledge, which is the basis of Western knowledge and conveyance and emphasizes embodied knowledge. I mean, Aiko and Kane-san in this, you literally have to use their own body, their feet to create the, the object. But also there's this like one fly that keeps on flying around like within the frame and it kind of highlights and brings in your senses. So it reminds you, this is fish, you know, it attracts flies, but also the skin and the smell. Um, and it's just, creates a whole new way of looking at this object. And you can see this film was expired by the object in the pit rivers on, in the picture on the other side. And it kind of moves away from this very kind of mechanical, technical way of describing it and like puts you in it. But also it caught fight, last point, it also calls to light um, ongoing indigenous concerns about land and water rights. As one of the things um, Ico types up on the top is like, can you, can you find, can you buy, a whole salmon in your 
local supermarket. And the whole idea behind that is that the Ainu have been banned from commercial fishing since the late 19th century by the Japanese government, which means tied to the cultural practice of making Ainu skin boots and Ainu skin raincoats, they can't do that because they don't actually have access to fish unless they buy a whole fish. And most supermarkets sell your fish pre-cut and cleaned. Um, and so it's, you know, kind of the issues that are current that also concern um, indigenous populations today is also brought into this. And I'm gonna end this because I went over time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marenka, huge thank you. Just out of curiosity for anybody who wants to see that film in its full version, is there a link to it that you can oh, share? Yes, I can pop That'd that be lovely. now once I... I'll... Thank you. <laughs> But it's a really, it's really interesting how that kind of literally from labels to real life, isn't it? It's that kind of bringing something, bringing its value, bringing it, it, its relevance right through and, and really thinking about what labels represent is so important to what we do. So thank you for sharing that. We've had three really interesting um speakers all with their own thoughts their own provocations their own kind of lens on this subject the theme running through feels very strongly about representation and around what that means for us um, and a reminder to all of you please if you have questions bubbling away or things that you're curious about please pop them in the chat because we'll pick those up in a minute and um, before we dive into the questions from from you there's a few that we're just going to kind of bounce about between um, Marenka, Annabelle and Esther. And I'm just going to kick off with one um, around leadership, actually, and how in this climate now, um, museum and gallery leadership offers an environment that fosters and supports new approaches to curation. You've all talked about working in different ways and, and creating space and creating places for new people and new practice to come through. How does that work in the context of leadership as well? Who would like to dive in first? Shall I? Shall I? <laughs> Thanks, Annabelle. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, going back to the, the idea of kind of challenges and opportunities, that it's a leadership, yeah, I suppose it's about en enabling change and, um, and I think that there's, you know, challenges are opportunities and opportunities can be challenges. And I think it's about grasping that and um, really, I suppose, reflecting about, thinking about relevance and that um, quite often I think that the impact on leadership is that it is about creating those opportunities. It's not necessarily feeling that you, you need to do everything. It's realising that actually you, you need to open up and um, uh, think about, yeah, like I said, like relevancy, opportunity, um, innovation, and um, yeah, under, uh, perhaps underrepresentation as well, and how in your role uh, or the, the, the kind of leadership position you might have that the actual power is in about um, quite often delegating that, giving space for others. Thanks, Annabelle. And Esther, for you, what's your sense of where leadership enables that? And what have you experienced of that? Um, I think one thing, actually, I'd really like to pick up from Marenka's presentation. I really loved your kind of labelling kind of a checklist, if you like, of what you do around um, challenging those hierarchies. You know, what is the knowledge? Who Who what kind of knowledge is being privileged. And so I think that can be applied in all kinds of settings. So I think particularly around leadership and let's, you know, let's, let's really examine where we're privileging certain types of knowledge and where we're privileging certain types of people that have kind of always been in museums. And let's think about how we can kind of like challenge some of those sort of underlying conditions that have been there for many many years and I think actually that will give space to some really exciting changes that Annabelle was talking about you know let's not be as scared of change change mm -hmm. can be opportunity um, and let's sort of like open up 
to being more flexible and, and open to change. And again, I think if COVID shown us anything, it's like anything's up for grabs now. You know, let's see what yeah. we can do to change the way we operate. So, and that includes at leadership level as well. I think. Yeah. Thank you. And Marenka, for you, where has where have you seen kind of that leadership in museums and galleries create the space and enable the space for you and others to dive in? Um, I think, I mean, so in ways, having leadership that's not afraid to fail, does that make sense? <laughs> I think, because um, a lot of times, like, you know, people who are even like in leadership positions maybe are like afraid. And then when that is compounded on by the fact that, um, you know, a lot of kind of leaders don't, are also afraid, it's just doesn't, it basically caps what you, you feel like you can do. Um, and I understand like a lot of things that we were talking about kind of, it does scare people, right? On many levels, because it, it's diving into something that like takes a lot of work um, into something that you may not fully grasp yet. Um, but also, it also means giving up control mm. to be able to allow new voices to come in. And so all that's like really scary. Um, and I think like the, for me, at least the best, the, one of the best things that's come about is having like leadership within the institutions that are just like, you know, go for it. Like we are going to basically say that, you know, there's in some points you're going to fail and make mistakes. Um, but that in some points that like, really good things will come out of it um and I know that sounds really vague but I've seen it time and time again how paralyzed we get by like the thought of messing up um and I was just like literally we're trying to ask you to like completely rethink how you've been doing things for like a long time of course you're gonna mess up you know so just embrace that and full steam ahead <laughs> I love that I'm a massive fan of permission to take risks and fail and learn from that because that's the way that things change, things evolve and we move forward. So I love that. Thanks, Marenka. And following on from that kind of theme of trying stuff out and making space to work differently, what are the challenges at the moment um, within museum and gallery curation? Where are the challenges? What do you see? Esther, can I dive in with you? Oh, there are lots of challenges, aren't there, I think? Um, I think, although I've been saying, you know, the incredibly positive side in some ways that COVID has offered, it's also, you know, clearly been a huge challenge for the sector. I mean, the way museums have had to kind of completely readapt to the way they, you know, they're shut one minute and open the next. Visitor numbers are, you know, changing all the time. Can you have people or can't you have people in? So I, I think there are unprecedented challenges at the moment, as well as opportunities. But, um, and also, of course, a lot of that is tied in with funding and, and all of those other issues too. Um, but I suppose it, it's finding those opportunities out of those challenges and not losing sight of that and being kind of swamped by feeling that, you know, all of these things are too much for us to kind of, wade through and get on top of um uh so yeah keeping focused on 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 the opportunities that can can come out of change thanks esther and i guess in the past year we've seen um a huge challenge for museums in thinking about how they revisit um narratives they present in their collections and reimagining how they work with audiences as well um as you've heard from from, from all of you actually which is really important so where I guess what are the positives from that in terms of what will what will people experience when they visit a museum gallery now or in the future as a result of these changes these shifts I think that, that point about hierarchies that's been mentioned a lot I think that's a major uh, changed and I think it's a kind of challenge that museums and collection holding organizations need to really uh, address and kind of celebrate actually that it's that divesting the high you know, um the, the kind of the perceived power maybe um and uh I think I mean it's been a long 
it, it's not something that's kind of happened overnight, but that notion, you know, there used to be the a kind of notion that museums were neutral and kind of non-political neutral spaces. And that's that's completely not true. And I think that's that's something though that is a real opportunity. And but it's a real culture shift internally and you know, potentially for audiences as well, but that that's how we can really um I think that division between organisation and audience, there's some really exciting challenges and opportunities about how to really renegotiate that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And Marenka, for you, where um, are you seeing the opportunities? Well, so I was thinking, as you um, just mentioned, Annabelle, about kind of renegotiating that relationship is like, so one of the things that came out over kind of lockdown <laughs> The museum was when uh, the pit rivers removed some of the human remains that were on display and mm -hmm. that caused like a whole uproar <laughs> um, and I think one thing that's really interesting is that kind of because everything kind of moved more digital and online then we started to engage with people but also like critically like engage with people online and kind of about you know like how they felt and thinking of things about memory and the ideas of like ownership over collections but also like how they kind of perceive, um, perceive some of our collections as well. And it was really kind of really great because um, now we kind of have like this very large like, overview of, you know, like our, like our audience members, but also how I think a lot of things that are completely tied with the kind of nostalgia of it, but then when they actually came into the museum, they were like, oh, like this isn't as different as we thought it was going to be. Um, and actually we see your point about how some of these objects were basically kind of um, reiterating stereotypes, not really teaching us anything about, for example, the schwa, um, with, with the shrunken heads where we have other people and all these kind of things. So um, it's like kind of been very, because we've been so be able to focus more kind of digitally, we've had like this kind of wider exchange as well. Um, partly you've been listen, also listening more to the public and the audiences, yeah. but also be able to at least try to also kind of break down our thought process in a way that's maybe a little more transparent, you know, through a lot of like webinar series and social media and like things that I guess we didn't really, the tools were always there, but I feel like we've much more comfortable with- Thanks, Marenka. That's brilliant. Thank you. I love that sense of how the dialogue increases rather than reduces, actually, because of the change. That's really interesting. And some of the questions in the chat, if that's OK. We've got one very practical one from for Esther around whether your survey comments are available to read online. And if they are, I guess there's a question about if you can post something about that. Um, they're not at the moment. <laughs> But we are literally, as we speak, writing a report that is going to kind of share those survey comments and some of the others that we've had. So if I'm able to share that with Kate, maybe once it's um, uh, live, then maybe she'll be able to share that, hopefully. Lovely. That'd be grand. OK. And some other questions in the chat, please. Please um, feel free to throw questions in the chat and we'll pick them up. So there's a question here from Russell about how the panel feel the future economic climate might impact on creating change in museums. Um, his context is around local authority um, and how as a sector we push for support. So who would like to respond Russell, around climate change and how that might impact on creating change in museums? Annabelle. Um, gosh, I mean, I think that obviously funding is going to have a huge impact. Um, you know, the, the, the amount of public spending over the last year is quite phenomenal. And I think that, um, that there's obviously a concern that the um, arts and culture sector within local authority is going to get cut because it'll be uh, deemed not as relevant as perhaps the hospitals and you know it, it's in a way it's an age-old debate that's not new to people who work in museums I mean I think that everybody's going to become more um, 
I can't think of the word, sorry. But just thinking about how we, we're gonna, we're always as a sector very good at doing um, a lot with less and probably that is something. But I also wonder if it's gonna be, turn out to be an opportunity to develop partnerships in different ways. So about working with other organizations which you might not have worked with traditionally to enable um, kind of work to happen, um, projects to happen. I think that there's gonna be a, um, I think it's also about, as well, as well as the funding that you know this uh, the the impact of COVID about people the audiences and coming to museums and obviously you know really embracing the digital and the much wider reach you can you know in terms of people but also geographically, um, and how um, you know whether money will be channeled into digital activity as much as gallery activity as well. But I think it's something that you know there's no simple answer to, and it is going to be an impact, and we probably don't know the full impact yet. But it's going to be you know we're going to have to become more agile and uh, and more collaborative, which which are two things that are probably not bad. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Hello there, Agile and Collaborative. <laughs> what else? Who else? Um, to do climate change and the impact of, on that, on the museums. Varenka. Sorry, is this the same question about the economic climate? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, economic. I think everything that Annabelle just said, really, but also um, I think some of the worries that we have is the economic climate, but also that coupled with like political climate as well um, around funding um, mm. is, I think like a, quite a few people think, feel like they're in precarious positions um, because, you know, I think that we're all trying to do work that kind of, that, you know, seems new, but actually in a way isn't new. Like these are discussions that have been going on for a very long time, but I think like there's been this kind of, kind of greater uh, emphasis right now and but we also know that there's quite a lot of pushback against that you know and so i think sometimes like we worry like if we put in bids that use certain terminology or you know or want to maybe work with certain groups is that then going to make it less likely that we're going to get the money because you know it's obviously there's always like basically a lack of money in the sector but also now when you kind of put like kind of um political forces as it as well is that you know kind of puts us in a worse position um so yeah i think basically you have to be really creative around how you frame things um and again like partnerships and i think in this year i've seen so many more kind of like yeah partnerships between different institutions um just coming together and figuring out how are we going to make this happen um which i think is like really great um but yeah it'll be it'll be interesting <laughs> Definitely. And Esther, the work that you're doing is a brilliant example of very, of multiple partnerships, isn't it, really, to create change, about people working together, working across. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, Accenture as a programme has always worked in a partnership way anyway. We believe, you know, that's kind of the key way that we work. Um, but particularly with curating for change, if we didn't have our, tw our 20 museum partners, there's no way we could deliver the project but equally I'm uh, quite reassured I think to know that our museums very much value our expertise and feel like they've learned a lot already from us and are learning how they can really start to open up their workforce to disabled people and think differently about their collections so I think recognizing I suppose this is kind of going back to my previous point about recognizing different types of knowledge and how actually bringing different people together brings different knowledge with them and that really adds value um, and just to kind of add one more point about sort of the economic situation that you know I'd really um, encourage people not to kind of let this kind of work go by the wayside because they're just trying to kind of keep their heads above water and, and deliver the kind of core work because actually opening museums up to more people and bringing new insights and new knowledge in will actually really help to build more resilient and, and diverse organisations that have a longer sustainability to them because they become more relevant to more people and are therefore, you know, more valuable to more people. So, you know, I'd really encourage people to see this 
as core to their work rather than a kind of, oh, it would be nice to if we had a bit of extra money. Um, so yeah, keep, try, try and keep it kind of front and centre when we're thinking about museum and change. Thanks, Esther. And I wanted to pick up a point that Lola's popped in the chat um, about failing, making mistakes, allowing that um, ourselves, that's critical. Um, and she talks about, as a curator, I sometimes feel a lot of pressure trying to address many issues in the right way, balancing it with the expertise and what I can actually do. And I just wondered if there were any reflections on that or kind of top tip sounds crude, but suggestions or, or ways that you've managed to work within that tension and work well within that tension that you could share. Annabelle, me. You... Yeah, I think, um... I, th I think that's where the um, the beauty of exhibitions come into their own in that because they are by nature that you know they're temporary projects and obviously legacy of exhibitions is really important so that they're not just disappear but they are this kind of platform to test ideas and I think if th that's what I found is a real if, if that's what you're framing and I think that move away from exhibitions as being the the authoritative um, presentation of of a thing or a subject but actually that they are off you know their value can be in kind of actually you know we're going to explore this and this is what we're presenting but it, it's not a it's not a, a giving you know it's open to a discussion and is a platform I think and that's where you you can in a way you can take those risks but you can really use those risks to benefit in the in the longer term does that that makes sense <laughs> yeah thank you yeah. Marenka did you want to offer anything oh um, I totally yeah. get that question like <laughs> well, like I'm right there with you every day um yeah and but even on top of that like people assuming that you have knowledge that you don't like for one or I get asked about things in our um you know, the collections from the African continent all the time, from the Caribbean, born and raised, never even stepped foot on the African continent, um, but assume that I have those expertise or even assume when it comes to decolonial work, like everything comes my way. And I was just like, you're missing the point. This is work that everyone should be doing from conservation to collections, to technicians, to um, visitor experience, everyone, right? Like, so I completely get that and um, come up against the fact that it's like, I know nothing about most of the objects in the museum because there are a lot and they're from all different places and all different cultural groups. Um, and so I do tend to try and do way too many things at once. Um, but then I also have to realize one, say you don't know. I'm very comfortable with saying I have no clue. Or as we say back home in Creole, Masa, it means I don't know. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people are afraid of saying they don't know because they think that it might show that like they're not the expert or, um, you know, or it makes they think, oh, it makes me look stupid. I was like, no, that's not terms you should be used. And saying like you don't know, that's fine. Because I think we run into, from my experience, we've run into far more problems in the museum when people act like they know things, like they understand and know things instead of just saying no. I'm not sure um, that and also I think intentionality um, you know, is really key so kind of be very kind of clear you know um, as Annabelle just kind of said with um, exhibitions saying that this is not to kind of show this is you know the entirety of something this is us thinking through something so being intentional and transparent in what you're trying to do um, and so being saying you know that this, this is not addressing everything this is not the entirety of so and so experience. This is, you know, this is what we're trying to do and what we're trying to think. Um, I think, and once you're very clear with that and open about that, then even if when kind of you know mistakes may come about or anything, at least you you know you've started out with that very clearly, and so it kind of mitigates some of that pressure that you feel. I think if that's a like a useful answer. Yeah, no, there's something really important in there about being honest, honest to yourself and honest to others, isn't it? So you're really clear what those expectations are as well. Thank you. And Esther, just a final word from you on that, if you have any top tips about that balance. Um, 
I mean, really just picking up on what Marenka said, be honest about what you do and you don't know, I think. Um, and really maybe perhaps think about who else you can ask. Again, it's that collaborative approach, I think. Um, I'm really keen that we explore through Curating for Change the real genuine possibility of co-production, not just as a kind of tick box exercise, but actually, you know, so that so that our curators don't become the lone disabled voice. You know, I think Marenka maybe picked up a bit on that. You don't want to be the one person that everybody goes to. Like, oh, you're the disabled person, aren't you? You'll know all about that. So it's really important to say, actually, no, I'm not the expert. I have one experience. So I'm going to work with others so that I can hear their experiences too and share those experiences. So yeah, think about ways to involve other people other than just that curator in that curatorial role, because that has value um, with it too. Lovely, thank you, Esther. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And thank you particularly, obviously, to Anna Barmarenka and Esther for three really fascinating perspectives on and honest perspectives too on creating change and representation on thinking differently on thinking about how that actually creates new dialogue new engagement different ways of working and reiterating the importance of that now in our spaces in our museums and galleries that we we take that care and take that time to make a difference um, in what's what's present what's there and in who is making those decisions as well around what's shown um, and how it's presented. So thank you. Huge thank you to, to Maria for um, the transcription this afternoon and to Claude Leadership and to the Art Fund for making these sessions happen. Um, there's two of these webinars, obviously there is today, and then there is a second one coming soon, coming your way soon. Um, and Rachel from Claude Leadership will send through an email letting you know when that is on the website so that you can book for that as well um, and join that one too through the Claudia Leadership Events page. Um, but a huge thank you to Annabelle Marenka and Esther for your honesty, for your candidness um, and for your openness in sharing your practice and your experience um, because it's so valuable to hear um, all that you've talked, talked to us about today. Um, and we'll hopefully see you on the 9th of July for the next session. So big thanks, everybody. Thank you for Claw behind the scenes as well, doing the tech so magically. Lovely to see you all.